All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, August 18th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott? Present. Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Hassan? Present. Ms. Jose? Present. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Stoluski? Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Fass, if you could please call the roll of staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough? And Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Ms. Fass, if you could also please call the names of any additional staff members that are participating in today's meeting. I don't believe there are any additional staff members, but if I've missed your name, please say so. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, we will begin. It looks like our first item is new business, and that is an update on Black Boy Joy and Genius in BCPS, and that is presented by Mr. Handy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we've had our opening remarks from Ms. Scott. I'm going to give you all the update on Black Boy Joy and Genius, and then we'll have uh, the rest of our agenda from that point. So uh, this update I'm bringing to the committee this afternoon uh, really comes from an April uh, 21st meeting of this equity committee where we heard from school leaders from uh, Pikesville Middle School and Southwest Academy. Uh, there were two of the pilot schools participating in an initiative from the Maryland State Department of Education um, called uh, Achieving Academic Equity and Excellence for Black Boys. So in BCPS, we refer to the program as Black Boy Joy and Genius. So you'll probably hear me use these terms interchangeably during this meeting and perhaps other times that I speak on these. Uh, but again, when we talk about our program in BCPS, we refer to it as Black Boy joy and genius. So I wanted to bring uh, an update on this particular initiative and uh, throughout the course of the school year, I wanted to update the committee on some of the uh, programs that we uh, discussed with you uh, during last school year. But today we will look at this particular um, initiative. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, Today, I really want to talk to you about the impact. So when you all heard from our school leaders in April, they talked about the activities that they were engaged in. Uh, one was a mentoring program. Others were professional learning around culture responsive teaching. But what I'm really happy to report today is the impact that the schools realized from being engaged in this initiative. So um, please take some time, take a look at the, the impact that you see here on the screen. And this is what the school leaders reported that they saw um, happening within their, you know, in their schools and also between schools. Also, excuse me, I'll just ask Mr. Handy for those who are on the phone, if you um, could read through some of those. Yes, yes, Ms. Scott, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So first, um, collaboration across BCPS zones. So. For our pilot in BCPS, we did have one middle school from each of our three zones, uh, Golden Ring Middle from our East Zone, Pikesville Middle from Central Zone, and Southwest Academy from our West Zone. 
Uh, again, these schools participate in the statewide pilot, and we had the presentation in April from two of the three schools, and you may recall that the schools collaborated quite a bit um, across zones, and one of the highlights was the three schools taking um, their boys to a uh, Morgan State football game and interacting with the, the student athletes and really um, engaging in another level of mentoring, if you will. So that collaboration has been key. Um, also, the teacher's reflection and increased knowledge around culture responsive teaching, uh, which was a goal going in. Uh, the self-interrogation self um, is key, and this is teachers really interrogating self around how their culture shows up in the classroom. So when we talk about our work around equity, around cultural proficiency, it, it starts, my work starts with me, right? So it, it's, it's personal work that I engage in, and then I engage in the interpersonal work as I interact with this committee and with other members of BCPS and stakeholders. So they noticed that teachers were becoming more adept at the self-interrogation part about their own identity and how that showed up in the classroom when they interacted with their students and how that made for a more culturally responsive classroom. Um, that tied into the next uh, impact and you saw um, culturally relevant visuals and that's about knowing who's in your classroom, knowing the, the cultures that are represented within that classroom and making sure those cultures are celebrated and acknowledged by the visuals um, that you see within a classroom. So think about how all classrooms um, you know, they're they're decorated in some way. There's always something on the walls. There's something that provides uh, stimulus and feedback for students and anyone who walks in that classroom. Uh, also, when they did their data analysis, they made sure that they disaggregated the black male student achievement. So this is the intentionality piece, making sure they, um, if the goal is to actually improve outcomes for black boys, to make sure that's actually being done when data is being analyzed. The next item was, really the rapport they saw um, among the boys, so a higher level of camaraderie and connection among the boys that were in the program, and then also increased rapport between the boys in the program and the, the staff who were involved in the mentoring. So really um, that rapport between mentor and mentee. Um, this next item is something that I want to talk to you about um, a little later in this presentation, and that's taking what uh, these three schools have learned and then transferring it to more schools within the district. And when we brought this to you all in April, that was one of the questions, you know, is this something we're looking to expand? And I'm going to give an update on um, expansion plans here um, during today's meeting. Excuse me. Um, also, the lesson plan um, and implementation was more student centered. And uh, again, it's not just taking, you know, a, a course guide as, as created and just bringing it to the classroom with no um, regard for who's being taught. It's actually taking the lessons, taking the standards, the outcomes um, that must be addressed and knowing, you know, the students' interests, um, their cultures, their perspectives, their lived experience, and making sure that, you know, those aspects of students are being leveraged and helping students meet the academic standards. Uh, the next item is about, again, that qualitative piece from students, students reporting that they felt a higher sense of belonging. They felt pride in their school. Um, they felt um, pride and a greater sense of belonging even outside the classroom and outside the school. Next, there was you know targeted responsive instructional practice for uh, black male learners. And these were research-based practices, um, using those practices uh, to realize better outcomes um, for our black boys. And that was actually um, another impact um, from the initiative. And then lastly, um, behavior incidents and, you know, office referrals, suspensions. Um, we saw a decrease in behavioral incidents at the same time, an increase in academic achievement. So uh, these were a few of the, uh, the, the impacts from the program. And it's, uh, again, another reason we'd like to take this to scale um, and expanding it to other schools in BCPS. Next slide, please. All right, so this particular slide, we're going to uh, take a closer look at the, that really that last item we talked about as far as the impact. We wanna look closer at the academic and social emotional uh, impacts from uh, the program. So the first uh, column and at the top of that column, you see uh, Pikesville Middle School. 
And at Piceville Middle School, 75% of the students who participated in the program uh, saw improvement by at least one letter grade from the second quarter to the third quarter in at least one of the four major subjects. Additionally, 75% of those boys participating had an A or B in math for the third quarter, and then 70% of those boys had an A or B in English language arts for the third quarter. So again, you see the academic achievement at Piceville Middle. Uh, Southwest Academy, 55% of the students showed improvement by at least one letter grade from second quarter to third quarter and at least one of the four major subjects. 58.8% of the students had an A or B in math for the third quarter. And then 64.7% of the boys had an A or B in English language arts for the third quarter. So you see the level of academic improvement uh, for boys participating um, in this initiative. And then on the social emotional side, um, if we could just advance the, um, thank you. Um, so on the social emotional side, we have Piceville Middle again. And looking at the office referrals, you see a decrease from quarter one through quarter four. So really 26% in quarter one, going down to 14.8 in the second quarter, down to 7.4 in the third quarter, and then down to 5% in quarter four. At Southwest Academy, and I'll just uh, channel um, a bit of Principal Franklin when she presents this information. Uh, she talks about, you know, they selected boys who needed support around behavior. So 53% of students in quarter one were receiving referrals or had received referrals. In quarter two, it went down to 35%, uh, quarter three down to 29%, and then quarter four down to 18%. So you see the improvements made through the program. And this data was shared with um, by the principals from um, Pikesville Middle and Southwest Academy to their fellow middle school principals um, at our first annual uh, principal summer conference on July 20th. So I borrowed a slide just to share the good news uh, with the board equity committee. And based on these results, you know, it is a, an initiative, a program that we would like to um, take to scale, if you will, and, and see how it can impact more students across more schools. All right, next slide, please. All right, so um, in addition to uh, the uh, principals conference I spoke about, uh, we also attended the summit. So again, you see the B, this is an MSDE uh, sponsored event. Um, they had a second annual summit for uh, AAEEBB um, sponsored, but again, by MSDE and also the um, advisory council. This was on Tuesday, August 2nd. Uh, part of this uh, event, there was a student panel, it was actually student and staff members and we had representation um, from Piceville Middle School. So next slide, please. So this particular image, this is actually uh, a tweet from my Twitter account, and we have there in the front, you see Noah, he's a student at Piceville Middle. Um, he is a member of Black Boy Joining and Genius, and he was part of the student panel. Um, I believe Noah is a rising seventh, well, yeah, rising seventh grader, will be in seventh grade this year. And then you have uh, Assistant Principal Jackson there behind uh, Noah. And then to the to our left, you have Mr. Mays, who's one of the mentors at Pikesville Middle. And then, of course, that's me in the background. And really just excited to um, celebrate Noah, celebrate the school. Um, you notice there was a you know few likes to the tweet, um, but it was really just encouraging to see and hear from Noah and some of the other boys from across the state, what this program, what this initiative meant to them. So based on these types of results um, that I've shared with you, um, for this school year, we are expanding this program to each of our middle schools. Uh, leadership has uh, earmarked some funding for each middle school to receive funding to support uh, their mentoring program. And my Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, we're going to partner with our Office of College and Career Readiness um, and that office already has oversight of the mentoring programs in BCPS. So through collaboration, we're going to support our middle schools in uh, drafting plans to support their black boys through mentoring. And then uh, we're going to you know, help manage the funds and uh, make sure that they're working towards achieving the outcomes that they've that they're putting together in their mentoring plan. So again, we have a degree of success with our pilot schools those three schools and we're looking to take that to scale across um, about 25 middle schools in BCPS as well. So wanted to share 
um, that news with you all this evening. I'll pause at this point to see if you have uh, any questions or comments on on that update. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Handy. And um, yes, it looks like Dr. Hager has some questions. You can go ahead, Dr. Hager. Oh, um, thank you. I, um, I've, I've been a big fan of this project since I first heard about it, and it, I think it's a really exciting initiative that we're taking on. Um, and although the, the data, you know, I know they were just slides that you pulled together to highlight some of the main findings, but is there a more formal report that we can see? And I apologize if I missed you mentioning something like that when I was transitioning to my computer. Sure, Dr. Hager, no, no problem. No, um, yeah, so we will have more formal data uh, as participants in the MSDE pilot. Um, there is a, a data gathering component, of course, to that. So um, I will make sure that as soon as that data um, has been delivered to MSDE and it's in a format that'll give you some more detail, I'll bring that to the committee. But I, I uh, expect to have that for you all in the fall to give you some more detail on the outcomes of those programs. That's great. And so I assume that means there's an external evaluator that's involved with MSDE in the pilot or? Do um, I do I do not believe there's an external evaluator. They do have their, you know, their data staff um, helping with the gathering of the data and analysis, but um, I do not believe there's an external evaluator. Um, so they haven't mentioned one at this point. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, just when um, Dr. Hager was asking about an external evaluator, that's uh, external from MSDE. Was that what what you were referring to? Correct. That's awesome, Dr. Hager. That's how I understood yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, I'll, okay. often with with a big initiative, they'll contract out with you know someone who's not part of a school system or the state to to do a an evaluation that's you know unbiased and, and not involved in the work. Um, so I just was curious about that. I, I do want to add. Um, so this is, I guess, a two year initiative, if you will. So last school year, MSD provided the funding. Uh, you know, you can see it was a new initiative. We kind of pulled some things together. Now that we're in year two, I know they were going to make maybe a few changes on how um, school systems are able to secure the funds. And I can ask this to um, Dr. Hager and Ms. Scott and others if if there will be an external evaluator. So I saw what they did last year. I am awaiting some guidance for this year. But that's something I can ask about, like you said, to get that um, unbiased uh, evaluation, if you will, of, of the program. So that's something I can inquire about. But I know for last year um, there was not um, an external or independent evaluator involved. Great. Yeah, that would be great to to have. Okay. And you're saying you'll have that for us um, in the fall. OK. Yeah, I expect Thank to have you. it. I'll just just working with, um, you know, like I said, as soon as I can get some compile data from MSDE and see what we have um, available. I'll make sure I get that to you all. OK, were there any other questions from board members? Um, I had a question I wanted to know, will any of this information or the or the data matriculate into the um, equity audit that you're? Um, that um, may be coming up or that we will be working on? So I think what will be interesting Oh, sorry, Ms. Scott. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead. OK, so right, I think if you look at the timing, so, um, you know, we are looking to compile that data for you all, which would cover the last two years. Um, and then if you look at where that data stops and then where we're starting um, the, our expansion, if you will, of this program, I think we could, be, you know, we can do a comparison in that sense. In other words, we'll see once this program is in place, do we see more favorable outcomes? I guess in, in not this coming set of the data of the equity data, but the next set, if that makes sense. In other words, we'll see what's happened over the past two years, but now with this program in place, we can see if there's some impact. And understanding, you know, there could be some other things happening, not just this program, of course, uh, but I'd be curious to see how this program uh, would would correlate with um, with that data. Once we, so we're looking at really not this set that's about to come out, but I guess the the data after that, if that makes sense. That does. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Did anyone else have any additional questions? No. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. And it looks next is the Collective Equity Professional Learning Communities. And again, that is Mr. Handy. All right. Thank you, Miss Scott. Um, next slide, please. 
All right, so um, wanted to talk to you all about some of the work that we'll be doing within BCPS um, during the school year. Uh, and it's really aimed at uh, what you see there, see there on the screen right now. So that's, you know, if you look at our equity policy, which we've talked quite a bit about as part of this committee, uh, really BCPS's commitment to equity, equity uh, we really want to put that into action. And if you look at what's happened over the past couple of years, uh, particularly when COVID hit and then, you know, in BCPS, we had that ransomware attack. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, I guess a renewed focus, if you will, on racial injustice that happened throughout the country, um, really the time is uh, is now, frankly, on doubling down on our efforts and refocusing on our equity efforts. So uh, with approval from um, uh, leadership, we're able to really dig into um, our, our equity work. And I want to just give you all an overview of what we have planned for the school year and, you know, let you know about this early in the process and looking forward to bringing you some uh, further information as as the uh, the work develops during the school year. So again, this is about renewing our focus and our deep commitment um, to institutionalizing, number one, professional learning communities. So we're talking about, you know, educators working together with a focus on student achievement. So anytime you, if you look at the research on the literature on professional learning communities, it's ultimately about improving academic achievement for students. And when educators are working in these PLCs, that is the focus. So we're gonna take that focus and we're going to make sure we're doing it with an equity lens. And when we talk about our equity work, um, it has to equate into improve student achievement. Um, so there, there are aspects of the work um, that we engage in, but at the end of the day, if we do not see, you know, closing of achievement gaps and improve student achievement for students who have been underserved and marginalized, um, then we're really not uh, making the impact that we want to make as far as our equity work. So we're looking at focusing on our PLCs, and then if you look at our strategic plan as a school system, the compass, our pathway to excellence, each of our five areas in the compass has an equity and action statement. So again, we have our equity policy, we have our strategic plan. Um, the idea is that with these guiding documents that we actually put this work into place. And what I'm gonna share with you all as an as a update was introduced to our school leaders on uh, July 12th of this summer at the uh, virtual leadership team learning event. So again, uh, wanted to make sure you were aware of the, of the work that we're gonna be engaged in as a school system. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, to start with, we're going to uh, begin in this first semester of this school year, and we're going to go into our, our equity training. So uh, I would say probably almost 10 years ago, uh, BCPS engaged in, uh, I guess, intro level, if you will, equity training, and it was called Beyond Diversity. It was two full days of training. Really, when COVID hit, uh, my team adjusted some of the the content and the delivery to really fit the uh, virtual format and we've run some of the virtual training over uh, the past uh, year or so the difference here is now we're looking at different levels of the organization and making sure that uh, certain uh, members of team bcps are engaged in, as cohorts with in this training and i'll talk to you about those cohorts here in a minute so wanted to share the objectives of our Engage Y Equity, which it's about 10 hours of content um, looking to achieve these outcomes. Number one, um, examining practices that they relate to equity and access as defined by uh, a couple of key BCPS policies. Of course, 0100 is our equity policy. Um, 0300 is equal um, employment opportunity. And policy 4003 is uh, recruitment and selection um, in regards to staff. So if we look at these three policies, I would offer that regardless of a staff member's role in BCPS, these are three policies that really do impact um, each individual um, who is a member of Team BCPS. There are other uh, policies we could point to uh, that are um, referencing 0100 as our equity policy, but we really do focus on those three policies to start with. Um, secondly, we're looking to apply equity tools to facilitate and engage in courageous conversations. So when we do uh, data analysis, when we have conversations about student achievement, about um, student behavior, um, 
it really serves us well to have courageous conversations, disaggregate the data, actually identify, um, you know, student groups, you know, by race and other um, identity markers. So to do so effectively, we apply um, some equity tools and we call this our, our protocol. Um, and this is part of Glenn Singleton's work, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail in the next slide. So one aspect of the protocol is the courageous conversations about race compass or the CCAR compass. And um, again, I'll talk about this in a little more detail. There's also four agreements and then there's six conditions um, to the protocol. We focus on conditions one and two um, as part of engage. Uh, next, we talk about uh, developing a common language. We know how important it is um, to use language that is agreed upon and common amongst participants. So we talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion vocabulary or DEI vocabulary. We want to make sure that all participants have a shared understanding of the vocabulary that we're using. And then also um, have a, a shared understanding of that protocol that I just shared with you all. So that's another part of um, our engaged session. And then lastly, and I would I would offer this might be the most important piece is that critical self-reflection. So remember when we talked about our Black Boy Joy and Genius Initiative. We talked about the the need to have self interrogation, um, and it's that critical self reflection again. So if I'm going to do this work, you know, it starts with me really personally, and then it moves to the professional, and along the way, um, I need to constantly um, self reflect um, and 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 critically so. So making sure that my actions, knowing they have an impact on student outcomes. Um, being uh, critical about those 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 aspects of my behavior, of my actions, being in community with others as I you know critically self reflect on my role in achieving more equitable outcomes for um, each and every student in BCPS. All right, next slide, please. All right, so I've talked to you all a little about the protocol. I want to just go into a little more detail so you can see in the lower left hand corner just citing that this is from Glenn Singleton's work. Um, the book is called Courageous Conversations About Race. Um, and this is from the 2014 edition. So again, on the left, you see six conditions. We focus on the first two. Um, number one is being personal, local, and immediate uh, when we uh, have any type of discussion. So I'm gonna speak from my first hand lived experience. I'm gonna keep the conversation uh, really first person singular, so I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for anyone else. And then isolating race in conversation. So if we're talking about black boys being mentored, that we actually say that, uh, that we don't use coded language, that we're being very um, explicit about what we, what we, um, in isolating race number one, and then talk about the race that we're isolating. So the first two conditions are what we call the engage conditions. Conditions three and four are sustain, and conditions five and six are deepen. So the way um, the protocol is presented is that we look to engage with those first two conditions, engage in the conversation, and then we're looking to sustain conversations and um, eventually deepen the conversations, again, with the, I, the idea that this will improve student outcomes. We also use the compass, which you see in the upper right-hand corner, four quadrants of the compass. The compass is used. Um, so that when I come into a conversation, I identify how I'm entering the conversation, you know, which quadrant I'm in, um, and then I'm looking for the person or persons I'm having the conversation with to also identify where they are in, on the compass. The idea is that we move towards the center of the compass. That's when we can start to get some true understanding um, and hopefully again, move towards improved outcomes. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner or section of our slide, we see the four agreements. And again, these are like, you know, the ground rules, if you will, um, that you might have for any type of meeting or, or group interaction. And we talk about staying engaged because oftentimes when the conversation is about race, uh, folks want to disengage. Um, but the idea that we stay engaged, that we speak, that I, you know, speak your truth. Every participant speak their truth. It's not about getting it right. It's much about being true to who you are. Um, and again, your lived experience. So we, we want folks not to say what they think sounds um, appealing to others, but you know, speak speak your truth. Um, and then third, experience discomfort. Oftentimes, when we're talking about matters of race, matters of equity, um, it, it's not. It can be a, an uncomfortable conversation. So we need to understand, have that agreement coming in, because again, if we we know we're going to experience discomfort, we accept that, 
hopefully we will stay engaged in the conversation. And then lastly, accepting and expecting non-closure. Um, and that's the aspect of that, you know, these conversations can be messy. Um, they're, they're often not wrapped up within, you know, a single um, hour, single day. And, you know, knowing that this could go on for quite some time, but the idea is that we accept that and then we return to be engaged in the work um, once again. So again, just wanted to give you a brief overview of the protocol, which is part of that engaged training that I shared earlier. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about um, who's gonna participate and really our plan um, for, for training. And then you also see how we wanna put this work into action. So we're gonna start um, really next month. Uh, we're gonna focus on Engage by Equity, which I just gave you all an overview of. Uh, we will be in person and we'll have all of our executive directors and then selected central office leaders um, participating in the training. So um, I'll be facilitating that training along with uh, the specialists in my department. So we have four specialists in the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. So they will be co-facilitating those sessions along with me. Next slide, please. All right, so once we um, complete our training with executive direct directors and selected office leaders, we'll move on to the training for our school leaders. So this will be our um, principals and assistant principals, all principals and, and APs. Um, again, the same focus, Engage by Equity. We're going to take from October to January. Again, we're covering 10 hours, but we're going to split it over four sessions. Uh, we will be in person, and the facilitators for these sessions will be uh, the specialists um, from my department. So um, day in and day out, specialists serve as coaches and support for principals and school leaders. So it's ideal that uh, the specialists are there to facilitate these sessions uh, with these um, school leaders. Next slide, please. All right, and then um, in the second semester, we're gonna have our, uh, our professional learning communities or our visits. So one thing I wanna point out, the executive directors is not only our you know, executive directors from Department of Schools, but also our central office executive directors. So we're looking to apply this work in our schools and also in our central offices. So um, in the second semester from February to May, we're going to have our PLC school visits. So principals will uh, be selected by executive directors. We've actually started this work already and schools will participate in feeder patterns. So envision our high schools. They'll be the, the hub, if you will, the anchor of the feeder pattern. And then we have um, middle schools and feed and elementary schools that feed that high school. So they'll be part of the visit. So uh, we'll have a high, the high schools, really each high school more or less will have be hosting a visit. We'll select one middle school from that feeder pattern and then one elementary school from that feeder, feeder pattern to host a visit. Um, all schools within the feeder pattern, all those school leaders will be invited to, to be part of the visit. And the, the purpose is to share the practices, these evidence-based practices that the schools have implemented to close the opportunity gaps and increase student achievement for their underserved and marginalized populations. So we're looking to take our school progress plans, to take our equity training, and then put it into action to improve um, student outcomes. Next slide, please. So in addition to those school visits, we'll also be having uh, professional learning communities for our central office. It'll occur during that same time frame. Again, the focus will be to understand and apply the equity lens uh, central office executive directors and some selected central office leaders will host. The participants will be members of central office. And again, it's the same uh, focus, if you will. We're looking at the data. Uh, we're looking how departments work from a central office uh, standpoint to help close those opportunity gaps and increase student achievement for underserved and marginalized populations. So I'm excited to see us do this work in conjunction uh, between central offices and schools so we can see um, you know, the impact that can be made with that level of collaboration. All right, and next slide, please. All right, so that's the overview. Um, again, you see the timeline. Like I said, as things progress, I'm looking forward to bringing some information back to this committee um, to share some outcomes as they develop. Um, this time I will pause to see if there's any questions or comments. Well, that was very informative. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Does do any members have any questions or any comments? 
Um, I can start while well, I guess others uh, get ready. I wanted to know, I didn't see in there, are there any, um, is there anything where it shows the impacts of COVID and or how the impact of COVID is being factored in um, in regards to um, students who may have, um, who may need more support and things like that? Right, so Ms. Scott, I think some of that uh, may come out as we're uh, more so maybe in the in the second semester work as we go into um, to visit school. So one approach is if you look at a particular feeder pattern, you know we might see some impact that occurred at the elementary, middle, and higher school. So let's take your example. There could be you know impacts on certain communities from COVID, and maybe we see that in our data at all three levels: elementary, middle, high. And uh, the idea is that that might be the focus of that particular PLC. So that's exactly the type of uh, focus and the type of data and data analysis that we may see come out of our, our PLC work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Uh, it looks like there's a question from Dr. Hager. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, this, is, this was also a great presentation. Um, first of all, can we get the slides posted to board docs for this presentation? I didn't see them in there. Yes, uh, Dr. Hayes, they yes. should be posted. They should, but we'll make oh, sure okay. they they are. But I, I believe that. But we'll we'll make sure they remain okay. posted. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I looked and I, I maybe I wasn't logged in properly. Um, so uh, is really, uh, when I first joined the equity committee, Dr. Lisa Williams was on staff and she was doing trainings with the central office and with um, principals as well. And there was a train the trainer model. So how is this new training um, on the work that was done before? Um, and uh, I guess kind of how has it, this whole process evolved? I know there was the period of time when schools were closed because of the pandemic and kind of could you explain just briefly kind of how, how things have evolved over the past uh, two to three years? Sure, sure. So Dr. Hager, to your point, this is really picking up on, you know, the work that Dr. Williams was leading um, when she was with the department. Uh, we, we did notice that a couple uh, situations, I guess, might have had a, a negative impact on the momentum we may have had. So number one, you know, uh, COVID and 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 the ransomware caused us to disconnect quite a bit. The other thing was we've had quite a bit of turnover in school leadership. So the idea, and you know, that's why I feel like it's so important that we engage in this work at this point, is that, and we've already heard from some principals. So we, you know, we have our invitations out about the the training, and you know, some principals are like, well, you know, I've gone through previous training, you know. Do I participate here? And the, we, we want everyone to participate because we're truly trying to level set. So one thing is to take work that's been done previously. We've made some changes. So again, we have updated our content. Um, you know, some content remains, some has been has been um, changed and updated. So we will have some new content for anyone who's gone through previously. But the idea too is that every principal, every assistant principal um, has engaged in this training because we've noticed um, as we interact with, with our school leaders that some have and some have not. Uh, we've also heard because of COVID that um, it's been difficult to, um, you know, sustain the equity work in some of our schools that, you know, um, you know, schools need a higher level of support. So through this training, um, through this professional learning, we'll be able to firm up some of those relationships uh, with our schools. So I would say the, I don't know if as much as an evolution, but really like a recommitment, if you will, and, and a refocus. So really, as we try to, you know, we know we're not, you know, completely out of the shadow of COVID, but we want to make sure that we are continuing to focus on our equity work and put supports in place so schools can do that. But it, it is a, uh, I guess, a connection to that work um, that Dr. Williams and her team had started uh, when, you know, like I said, when she was a member of staff and when she was coming to you all. Um, I think, did you have another part of your question, Dr. Harry? I just want to make sure I covered everything. No, that <laughs> that was exactly what I wanted. Was curious about was kind of how how it all ties together. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the folks that had the training before will be asked to do the training again, just so that everyone is on the same page. I think that's really important. So for this work, and um, it's great to see how things how things go this year. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it looks like there was a question from Miss Hassan. 
Yes, hi. So first of all, thank you so much for this presentation, for sharing this information with us. All of this is absolutely amazing, and I, I can't wait to see how all of it unfold, unfolds um, from the uh, from like the learning communities, the professional learning communities to um, Black Boy Joy and Genius. I I think all of it is awesome and super amazing. So I'm very fortunate to be in this room, virtual room with everyone. Um, but I did have a question. So I guess something that I've become more aware of is the communication between central office to administrators to other members of the school community, namely students. So I guess how are we, how can we ensure that, especially between central office and administrative staff, that there's more communication, I guess, within that and between those two groups? I, I don't know if that makes sense. Like when I when I think of professional learning communities, professional learning communities and that discussion, right, we talked about um, training you know, central office and then separately training administrators. So I guess how do we create that bridge between what we're doing here to the administrators and keep that going? Travels yeah. all the way down to students and we ensure that accountability everywhere. Gotcha. So Ms. Hassan, I think if I understand correctly, so I guess the first communication or that first bridge between central office and uh, and our school leadership. So one thing that I really felt strongly about was having our executive directors, like again, our school side executive directors and central office training together. So trying to create some community in that sense. And then even though I did break out like the school PLC visits and the central office PLCs, um, we already have some central office leaders who say, can I participate in the school PLC? So we wanna see as much of that as possible, again, to help to build some common understanding between central office um, and uh, our school side leadership. The other piece of what you talked about, and ultimately the most important piece, like you said, is how does it get to students? Um, so we have that level, the our uh, executive level, our school leadership level. The idea too is to help build capacity within schools so that you know principals and assistant principals can support teachers and making sure that they are providing more equitable learning environments for students. So you know, interesting in your role. Um, you know, I'd be curious to see what kind of feedback that you hear, and hopefully it will be this year. Hopefully it will not, you know, there's got to be a sense of urgency and, and, and changes occurring that students do see, um, you know, a difference in, in that classroom, in that school around, um, you know, that, that diversity, the equity, the inclusion, cultural responsiveness, everything that we're trying to really um, actualize from Policy 0100, if you will. So, you know, the idea is that we really touch that leadership level. Um, I will tell you that we we plan to still offer some training um, from my team. We actually have a cadre of teachers we work with that also help us do training. So we want to make sure that we're allowing um, or giving training opportunities for folks outside of the group that I talked about as well, um, because we know we can't just be this select group um, that we really need to make sure that all staff have access to the training. But this is really like our our year one reset plan, if you will. Um, but as we move forward, you know, the idea is that school leaders, you know, help to build capacity with their department chairs, their instructional leadership team. They do so with their teachers. And then, like you said, uh, that 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 students, uh, you know, quickly um, have a more equitable learning experience. So um, that's that's the plan. Uh, we'll be monitoring it closely. And a lot of it is, you know, really getting some some feedback from students, too, on on what they're experiencing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I I strongly believe that hopefully we will get some student response, um, some student feedback and be able to see what it looks like from from my side of my point of view and my side of things. Um, but I'm hopeful to see how this evolves and how this grows. Great, thank you. Were there any other questions or comments? None? OK. Great, thank you so much for that, Mr. Handy. That was um, exceptional and um, look forward to how that unfolds um, through the year, uh, actually both presentations. Yep, you're welcome. And thank you everyone for the questions and input, appreciate it. Great, okay. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. Uh, the next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday, September 22nd, 2022 at 
4 p.m. Um, is there any further business? OK, so hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. I thank you all for joining us. You have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.